Hi, welcome everybody to our special Q&A with producer Lisa Onodera on the 1994 film Picture Bride, uh, which is directed by Kayo Hata. Uh, this is the first in the series of Q&As we're doing for what we're calling SADAF Online May Madness. Uh, May Madness is our way, first of all, of um, since we don't have basketball this year, <laughs> we can still get some madness um, in May. Uh, but it's also our way of celebrating Asian Pacific Heritage Month and to flesh out the history of Asian America uh, across the decades through some new and classic films. Um, so every week we're kind of, we're following through the decades this week. We're starting from the, the period before the 1950s. Um, and every week we're gonna try to organize a Q&A with filmmakers like we're doing tonight with Picture Brett. Um, if you wanna see more, we'll be back next week to chat about the documentary Limited Partnership, which is this incredible love story about the first ever lawsuit in America seeking recognition for a same-sex marriage. Um, but what few people realize is that one of the men in the lawsuit was Richard Adams, who was a Filipino-American. Mm -hmm. uh, so to talk about the film and this landmark case, we'll be bringing the director of Limited Partnership, Thomas Miller, together mm -hmm. with uh, California Assembly member Todd Gloria. Uh, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to host what I think was going to be a pretty inspiring conversation. And we're only able to do these Q&As with the support of our sponsors, which include Semper Energy, Pacific Islanders in Communications, and the Pan-Asian Staff Association of UC San Diego. We're also supported by a consortium of groups that remind us to participate in this year's census, uh, which helps build inclusive and representative communities throughout the country. All right, so let's get started with tonight's main event. Um, since this is a live virtual Q&A, we really want everybody to participate. I know there's a lot of attendees filing and ready. So there's two ways for you to participate. Um, one is through the chat function. I see some folks who have already started chatting. So this is your way of commenting on what you're hearing, seeing. Um, you could respond, you can communicate with other audience members. It's just, this was actually requested after our last um, Q&A session because it just helps us feel like we're still part of a community even if we're not physically next to each other. But if you wanna ask a question to Lisa, um, you should do so through the Q&A function. So the Zoom webinar also has a Q&A button that's different from the chat button. Um, so if you could just submit your questions through the Q&A. I, I can see your questions and I'm gonna work the questions into the conversations um, as, as we go along for the next um, hour or so. Um, you can start inputting the questions anytime you want. You don't have to wait for me to prompt you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to get through as many of these questions as I can. Um, so now I have the honor of introducing tonight's special guest, Lisa Onodera. So Lisa is the producer of some of the most landmark Asian American films. Uh, she was an associate producer of Arthur Dong's Forbidden City USA, uh, which is actually one of the other profiled films we have as part of May Madness this week. Um, she also produced the debut, uh, American Knees, and of course, Picture Bride, which uh, we're all going to be here to discuss today. So welcome, Lisa. Okay, so um, Lisa, we, I'm just curious because this is a film mostly made up of people who had not made a feature length film before. So I'm curious, like, where were you in your career when the idea of Picture Bride came about? I was uh, an undergraduate film student at UCLA and uh, just sort of feeling my way around and I met Kayo. Um, I helped her with uh, her, one of her student films called Otemba and uh, I just realized she had a vision that was incredibly unique and soulful and detailed and um, she was like, I would just, I wanted to do whatever she wanted i wanted to make it make it happen and um i had worked my way um through school working on japanese commercials so i had a lot of production experience and i'd worked on some tv shows so i could bring something you know to help kaya's vision come alive that, that that's pretty accomplished resume for an undergrad um well it took me forever it's not like i just went in and <laughs> I, I did like two years at junior college and then I went to SF State and the film program and it wasn't like I was a newbie. I was, you know, I was already scarred, <laughs> I was already working, you know. So. Was it pretty natural for you and Kayo to find each other at the UCLA Film School? Uh, you know, um, there were actually a good number of Asian American filmmakers there, um, but 
I, you know, Kyo and I just clicked. Um, we had an advisor named Bob Nakamura who was active at BC. Um, and uh, I mean, the things that she wanted to talk about, Hawaii, um, my family's from Hawaii, my dad's family's from Hawaii. Um, you know, working in the fields, my mom's family were field workers after the war. And I just, it just clicked with me. So, yeah. So you were there from the very beginning, because I know that, um, I think she said in some commentary that this was originally supposed to be a short film. Yeah. Can you talk about how it, how the, the original concept and how that turned into a feature? Yeah. Um, it was originally supposed to be a documentary about the field workers, about the songs, the Ohana songs that the women sang, because Kaya loved those. Like, she loved how rowdy and gutsy they were. And, uh, you know, just the sound of them. And so she wanted to do a documentary. Um, but in doing the research for that, she extracted this beautiful story of Veal. And um, it just kind of, it's what, you know, when people say it took on a life of its own, it's like those women started speaking to us and kind of like pushing us down this path. And it just grew and we felt like uh, we needed to recreate it. So oh, I'm sure it also took a lot of work. <laughs> it didn't just naturally yeah, come together. Yeah. It was it was a crazy dream. I mean, actually, I, I was looking at some of my journals and, you know, I had some entries back in at the beginning of shooting thinking we're crazy because uh, this seems too grand for us. And yet when we started sending the script around, we got people who were saying, what can I do? You know, and people in Hawaii were saying, well, we want to help with the costumes and how can I help? And, you know, Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa, who's, um, he plays Kanzaki, he was doing these like martial arts movies and things like that. And he's like, where do I sign? I want to do this. So it, uh, it kind of just started rolling. And we often felt like we're, this is way too big for us. We're scared, but we would just like, keep going. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> stupid, but. But we well, were probably totally, by something else, you know. I, I could totally see how folks in Hawaii would look at this project and see, feel like, you know, finally this is a film that can be about us. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about like the support, that, the financial support you were able to find, whether private or public, in Hawaii? Yeah, we got a grant, um, uh, 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 an arts grant in Hawaii, and that was a big deal. That was a big shot for us. It really pushed us over the edge in terms of you know, one, finance to shoot, even though we still didn't have enough money. But more importantly, credibility in Hawaii, because Hawaii is a, a it, it, it's kind of a closed place, and you can't just go there and prance around and say, I'm going to make a movie, and everybody just, you know, wow, bow down to me. That People are very um, family and very neighborhood, and you need to have an endorsement there to get stuff done. And, uh, and so our funding in Hawaii and Diane Malin Mark, who's one of the producers who was based there, made that happen. Because I, even though Kaya's dad was from Hawaii and my family was from Hawaii, you know, well-established in Hawaii, we still didn't have enough cred to build what we built there. So, critical. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you also got funding from the NEA, which nowadays seems in, like, like no one could even imagine the NEA funding first time filmmakers for a narrative feature. I know. So how did, what was that process like? You know, we didn't even think about it. I think um, one of the other filmmakers you interviewed said, we were, we were just innocent. Like we didn't have the fear. We didn't have anybody saying, well, that's dumb. You can't do that. Nobody will do that. We didn't have it because we just felt like we, um, we had a story to tell and it was unique. Uh, Kayo had an amazing graphic sense. So she laid out this beautiful proposal. Um, she, she laid it out so that it looked like a, a book, you know, and uh, beautifully written. And once again, we used the archival photos. We really researched and brought together a lot of archival photos. And when you are not used to seeing something like that, you're not used to seeing Japanese field workers in the cane fields, 
those photos were so evocative. So yeah, we got we got some money from the NEA. We got a corporation for public broadcasting grant. We got the um, Hawaii grant. Um, we were able to put together some private financing, and we went forward with not enough to shoot. I mean, to finish the movie, and that was really hard. And I don't recommend that. <laughs> However, if you, I don't know. People said we were uh, we were being like carried along by the Hawaii spirits, and they were just like making us do it, like you know, guiding us along. So we used to. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of spirits in the film and seem like yes. we're working with them. Yeah. For sure. We felt them. We totally felt them. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, um, a big part of what makes the film really come alive are the details, which, like, from our eyes, just looks really expensive. I mean, like, to, to try to, to do a period film, no less. You mentioned that there were a lot of folks in Hawaii that were, came out to want to support you with costumes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, how how important was it to have sort of local people to fill in the detail? Oh, that it wouldn't have happened without Ada Akaji, who's the costume designer, her assistant Michael. They worked incredibly hard um, all the time. Uh, Paul Gunshin, who's our production designer. I mean, all of those locations are existing locations. So Masuji's house, um, the plantation house. Um, you know, it was a stretch for us even to afford that wagon. I mean, you see that wagon in every single thing that there's a wagon, it's the same wagon. You know, when Yayoi leaves, it's the same wagon. When the Benshi comes, it's the same wagon. That was a big <laughs> expense for us. Um, but beyond that, um, our transportation, there's this company called Servco Toyota, and they donated minivans, which we completely trashed because we were driving on the dirt roads in the plantation, which are, which are just red dirt. And so, you know, uh, so transportation, um, the Teamsters who are all Hawaiian um, came and worked on our movie, even though we weren't really paying them what they were supposed to get, but we had to work with the Teamsters. They were incredible. When cars got stuck in the mud, these guys would come and like lift the back of the car up out of the mud. I mean, it was um, it was a big community effort, you know. Everything, food, people brought food. Um, yeah, it sounds like it was. I mean, you had a skillful team, but also a community came backed it, and they wanted to see this film exist. Yeah. Um, how, how how conscious were you when you were making that you were making a Hawaii film? I mean, like the film is a it's a love story. Um, it's, it's a kind of coming of age. It's an immigration story. But I when I watched it, I was like the ethnographic detail makes me feel like you guys put a lot of attention to taking the burden of saying we want to tell Hawaiian history. Yeah. Um, how much were you so so you, were you thinking about that a lot? And, a lot. And the details of history that maybe I, as somebody who's not from Hawaii, might not have picked up on. Um. Well, because a lot of the locations were existing locations, the texture of the wood, the plants, which are a part, a big part, the cane is a big part of the production design. I mean, it makes it seem very vast in scope. We really shot in a cane field, which is now a golf course. But yeah, but, but that provides this sense of scope. Um, the costumes were critical. Um, but you know, like the, the little cans that Matsuji keeps his orchids in, those are just rusty cans that are prop department aged, you know? Um, and I think Kayo just has this in, had this incredibly discerning eye where she would, she'd be able to look at the frame and say that that should go out and we need to move this six inches over and we wanna see the cane right outside the window, like immediately outside the window. So we've moved some cane out there, you know, so you get this sense of texture and a complete vision um, that was made from what we had basically. And with the exception of the costumes, because those were meticulously constructed by Ada from archival photos. Yeah, she made all of that stuff.
So this is one of the questions that, that an audience member has actually asked already. This is from Hyunju, who asks, um, when Rio arrives in Hawaii, she's wearing a Western style dress, whereas everybody else is wearing kimono. And that seems like a very deliberate choice. Can you talk about that? Or do you remember? Yeah. So Rio's story is that she's, well, it's a fish out of water story because she's a city girl. And the other girls that are coming as picture brides are farm girls. And so they come prepared in their, you know, regular traveling kimono and uh, their, their outfit is, a di is very different. She's the only one that has this beautiful cream colored silk chiffon dress. And um, because she's a city girl. So yeah, that was a very conscious choice. All her clothing, you know, um, reflects her transition from being a city girl to being a real Hawaiian, you know, woman. Yeah, um, and I think part of that trans transition that we see is also through language. And you mentioned that um, the, the eye to Hawaii, but also to me it's the ear to Hawaii and the way people talk. Yeah. Um, can you talk about like the really, at the time, I think rather radical choice to include a lot of pigeon and oh, yeah. talk about how that was trying, you, how you may have tried to be accurate to the history when it comes to the development of pigeon yeah. in Hawaii. No, we had, I mean, originally the script, if we had filmed the whole script, it would have been three or four hours long. We included the strike scene with the Filipinos joining the, the Japanese. We were very into culture and language and pidgin. And my dad would speak pidgin to me as a, as a, you know, he would just crack me up. And Kayo and I would speak pidgin together because that was sort of part of our experience in Hawaii. Um, and it had to be pidgin. And it also had to be Japanese. And uh, Kayo was very influenced by Ozu, the Japanese filmmaker. And so much of her framing and the cadence of the um, dialogue is from Japanese movies. And so, uh, and Yuki got that. And uh, they, were, they were really in sync about how Yuki's language developed from being a city girl from Yokohama and speaking Japanese to being part of and to being Kana's best friend and then to being established in Hawaii. Yeah. No, the pigeon was really important and also the Tagalog. Mm. Extremely important. There used to be a lot more Tagalog in the movie. And, and that also speaks to the importance of thinking across ethnic lines and, mm -hmm. and so the story of labor um, mm -hmm. is important in there too. Um, and I think I, I think was Kayo, was she work in labor activism? Is that what I heard? I don't know if you recall that. Um, I'm sure she, I, I hadn't heard about that myself, but I can see that she would be. Um, when she was at Stanford, she was extremely politically aware. And she, you know, I think all of us started this film with a, with a mission, you know, and um, that mission was to be as, as, accurate as we could be um, addressing multi-Asian world in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, the story of labor in Hawaii is actually one of, the, one of the projects that we tried to develop was All I Asking For Is My Body, which is about two, two brothers who are, um, they, they, it's like a fight, um, a fight circuit that in the plantations young men used to go around and fight on payday and there would be betting and stuff it's a beautiful novel and so you know she's just she was she was into labor and telling the story of it so we wanted to include the great strike when all the plantation workers chinese portuguese filipino and japanese joined together for rights um and it was an amazing story but we had to cut it out <laughs> because we couldn't we couldn't have a four hour long movie yeah we had to end it we had to be about 90 minutes yeah. so. you mentioned that kayo is a fan of japanese cinema and i, I suppose that, it, that extends to the casting as well so maybe i could just i just have to ask like how did toshiro mifune get involved in this movie his, his yeah. last his last role and not yeah. just any role he plays a benshi and so for me, like he, he symbolizes all of film yeah. history and Japanese film history. And so what a beautiful yeah. like, tribute to him. We were totally uh, daring, you know, sitting in my house in Santa Monica, 
and that was part of our casting process uh, was who would you who would you love to see in this movie in this role and uh, we looked at lots of Japanese actresses. We had a casting director working for us in Japan. Um, and we just loved Yuki. Um, and then we were just like, what do you, you know, who could we get, who could we get, you know? And uh, we ended up trying to contact Toshida Mifune and we got rebuffed many times. Um, but he actually had a, a real fondness for Hawaii. And he had gone there on vacation many times and he really wanted to do the movie. And after a long back and forth, because we didn't have the money to pay him, really, he said yes. And as soon as he was, yeah, he said yes, we were terrified. We were like, oh my God, we, we, we don't have any food. We, what are we gonna do? Where is he gonna stay? Cause we were all staying in this crappy apartment and with no furniture. And so we went to uh, one of the big hotels in Waikiki and we said, we have Toshiro Mifune and he's gonna come be in our movie. And they're like, get out of here. And we said, we, look, we have him, he's coming. And they, they gave him the penthouse suite. Um, and it was a beautiful suite. It was a, with a big ocean view. And uh, we, we, got one of our interns to be his driver, the dedicated driver, which for us was a huge luxury because everybody else was driving by themselves and, you know, driving wrecked up cars. So he had a driver and he had a suite. And the day he flew in, we had been shooting all day. We were terrified and we knew he was in the hotel and we got word from his people because he traveled with his entourage that um, he was here and he wanted to see us. So we didn't have time to change and we were covered in mud and we were all sweaty and, you know, uh, we looked tired and, and dirty. And we went into the hotel and we tracked mud through the lobby and tracked mud into the elevator. And he met us in one of the ballrooms and he had his kimono spread out on the table in front of him that he brought from Japan. Because the kimono that he's wearing at the benchy was is a real kimono. <laughs> it's his. And um, he had an array of them. And uh, he bowed and he bowed. And he showed us the kimono and we were completely gobsmacked. Like we had no, we had no words because it was such finery. And he said, is this good? Is this one good? Or maybe this one is better. Takayo, and we were just like, ah, <laughs> ah, that one. And um, his favorite color is pink, and so his driver, who was just like devoted to him, uh, got everything pink for him. And um, just, we just treated him, and we were out just on pins and needles for the, you know, four days that he was there. Like, but there's nothing like, the beautiful grace that he brings, you know? And Kayo quickly thought up some lines for him to say. Because originally the bench, he, you know, just, he just come, kind of goes across the screen and then we cut to the, to the movie screen. So yeah, that was terrifying. <laughs> well, it's, it, well, it must've been the greatest internship of all time where we got to drive, drive him Yeah, I still remember that guy. He was awesome. Yeah. That intern was amazing. So when you cast Yuki, I mean, I, th I think at this point she was in Mystery Train. Yep. So, I mean, what, so she had, was kind of known, um, at least to the extent that, like, we know her English, she could probably get by with English. W mm -hmm. Were there a lot of people to choose from at that time? A lot of actors, lot. whether domestically or in Japan. Yeah. Uh, and we obviously knew of some amazing American Japanese actresses, like Tamlin. And Tamlin, you know, she just shook us all. She's so beautiful and strong. And it was a really tough decision, but Kayo wanted to go with somebody who was from the old country and somebody who was innately Japanese and who looked weak and frail. And, um, and we saw Mystery Train, um, you know, sort of same thing. We reached out to her her in Japan 
And she wanted to do it because after her experience with Jim Jarmusch, she wanted to work in America, whereas a lot of Japanese actresses were kind of afraid to work in America. And they didn't know what we were doing and they didn't kind of have a sense of, you know, what, what independent film was, whereas Yuki understood independent filmmaking. Right. And so she came forward, you know, but um, yeah, no, she's, she's just amazing. Well, she brings a lot of authenticity to like, how do you respond to this new world? Because mm -hmm. she's not from there. Mm -hmm. At what point did Miramax get involved? So we finished shooting and we had no money. And we came back and we were exhausted and we opened an editing room because back then you would shoot the film and see dailies. We saw dailies once a week in Hawaii. And then the film would just sit there. And so we had an editor putting it together, but uh, you know, it was nowhere near there. And we thought, well, we should try and go to Sundance. We finished in, I think, I think we finished in August and we wanted to get it cut together and show it to Jeff Gilmore at Sundance. And uh, we thought that's how we would get money because we didn't have any money left. Um, and we couldn't, we really couldn't get together a pretty good cut. Like our cut was so rough, but we ended up showing it around. So we showed it to um, the Sam, the Goldwyn Company, Miramax, uh, Fine Line. Um, I can't remember all the other ones, maybe Lionsgate, I don't New Line, showed it to New Line. And um, it was in Japanese. <laughs> and it was like three hours long. And it had no sound mix. And there was a ton of other stuff that was really, looked really rookie because we had shot a whole scene inside a ship on a low budget, which was, it looked like a Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> it was not good. Um, but, uh, it came down to, uh, Harvey Weinstein and, uh, Ira, what's the last name? I can't remember. Um, Ira Deutsch and, uh, the person from the Goldwyn company. And, uh, we picked Miramax because at the time they had just released the piano and Kaya really liked the piano. We all did. And we felt like they were, they were movie makers and that they would be able to help us where we didn't understand what we were doing. And they were also marketers. So we wanted this movie to be seen by as many people as possible. And so we, we picked them. And they came in and they gave us some money to finish it. And they uh, brought on an amazing editor, Lindsay Klingman, who cut A River Runs Through It. Um, incredible woman. She also cut One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, helped us understand what sound does in a film. And helped us understand where to put music. And uh, we reshot. We, we, uh, we went back to Hawaii and reshot a lot of scenes, including fire, some of the fire scenes. And we reshot uh, love scenes between Yuki and Matsuji in Tokyo because Yuki couldn't leave Tokyo. So Miramax helped a lot. We skipped Sundance and Jeff Gilmore said, you'll never get that. We, we actually got in that year, but our cut wasn't ready. And he said, forget it. You'll never get into Sundance again. Forget it. You can't come back. But we got back. We went to Sundance <laughs> the second year and we won the audience award. Yeah. It was this is related to a question that's been asked, which is, I mean, around this time, I mean, it wasn't like there were a ton of stories about Asian immigrants that were in the mainstream. I think I mean, Joy Law Club had just come out, I think. Uh -huh. I read, yeah, it did. Uh -huh. um, but what do you think, was it hard to shop the film around to distributors because this topic was just not a proven entity yet? Or what, what were the strategies for pitching it to film at this time? Okay, that, that, was, that was another thing where we didn't know any better. We didn't have a voice in our head saying, you can't do that. And also, also people like Arthur. Arthur just really 
said, well, why can't you do that? You know, just do it. And, and uh, yeah, we just didn't, we just didn't think that way, I guess. Um, I heard, I had plenty of people saying to me, oh, wow, what if it was like, what if all the picture brides turn into zombies and they're coming through the cane <laughs> field and it's like ghost zombie picture bride demons and, uh, or you need more sex. Like all the geisha and the gambling house should like, there should be big sex scenes. And, 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 you know, Kayo just really stuck to what the story was. And that's how, that's how we did it. So, but I don't know. Dumb luck, I guess. <laughs> no? Cause we didn't. Well, well, things worked out, including getting into the Cannes Film Festival. Can mm -hmm. you talk about, I mean, as far as I can tell, and, and if anyone can um, say otherwise, I, don't, I think this is the first Asian American film to get into, to be an official selection of the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but. Um, well, actually, I mean, it might have been Asian American, but there are plenty of Asian, I mean, all the Chinese. Oh, definitely. Like, yeah, Japanese films have yeah, won. I mean, Japanese yeah, Japanese yeah. and Chinese filmmakers. And it helped that Miramax had done Raise the Red Lantern. They understood marketing an Asian movie to some extent, you know, and um, I mean, really having Miramax help us with getting ready for Sundance and getting ready for Cannes made it so that we didn't really have to do very much. It was like a crazy dream. And um, it was very tiring. It was really super tiring for Kayo because she had to do a lot of press and she's not a super talkative, flashy person. Uh, so that was really kind of, you know, that was sort of how we felt about Kim. And it was like, oh, it's so tired. We're so tired. <laughs> It's tiring as a, like, I, I've been a canon, it's tiring just as a participant. I can't even yeah. imagine it's like as a filmmaker. I know, that sounds so lame to say. We were tired at can, but we were pretty tired. And then, yeah. and then my whole family, including my parents who were divorced, came and they were there and that was stressful too. And then, like, everybody's, everybody's boyfriend came and they were all hanging around. And then when they weren't hanging around, you were like, where are they? What are they doing? And, um, but it was a big party. It was a great big party. It's great. And that must have been like the beginning of an incredible reception. I mean, one of the questions that we have here is, did you expect the great reception of the film at the time? Um, yeah. No. I mean, we didn't know what to expect. That's the other thing. We had no expectations. And I mean, I think the most rewarding screenings were in Hawaii. When mm -hmm. we went back to Hawaii and we showed the film, and people were just like, wow, I'm in the story. And, you know, this is so resonant. And people cried. I mean, people were always coming out of the theater, just their faces wet with tears. And then when we screened in Tokyo, we went to the Tokyo Film Festival. I think those two. And then the Bay Area. That was a big deal because we, uh, we screened at the Oaks Theater in Berkeley. So that's sort of home ground for us. <clears throat> but um, but Hawaii and Tokyo were very deep for us because we really felt like we had grown it back to the people that we had made the film about and the people we had made the film for. That was unreal. I, I want to get back to the Hawaii stuff because I think that is really at the core of why this film is so important but I am now that you've brought, brought up the Japanese screen the Tokyo screening what was the Tokyo reception like the Japanese reception um I mean it's about an earlier history and and it's a, it's a part of their history as well and I don't know how well it's taught there so I'm curious what the, re the response was they love I mean as far as I could tell people loved it you know um they're curious about the people that left Hawaii you know what happened but left Hawaii I mean, left, left, Japan. left Japan sorry that they're, they're really curious because there was a big exodus, you know. Um, my, my family came, went from Wakayama to America and, you know, they wonder what happened. You know, just like uh, Irish immigrants are curious about the Irish experience in America. And, and then I think narratively and dramatically the film works really well. And there was an element of pride there that it was an American movie and it had Yuki Kudo and this Japanese, these Japanese actors, and they're showing where those people went and what their story was. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> That's great. 
Did the film get a release in Japan? Like a commercial yeah. release? Yes. Yeah, we had a theatrical release there. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I do want to get back to the Hawaii um, response. In fact, I want to read just the entirety of one of the questions that somebody wrote okay. because it's so moving. Um, this is from Alex Yamashiro who writes, uh, thanks so much for joining. What I love about our heritage is that we are really humble and all farmers at heart. My grandfather was originally from Yokinawa, oh, Okinawa, and my grandmother was also a picture bride. Me being oh, wow. a sensei and not growing up in Hawaii, but wanting to keep that history with my children. Mm. Um, so my question is, other than creating s movies, what have others that you have met do to keep this amazing history going? You mean personally, as a family, or? Maybe um, both, right? Like, uh, yeah. like official histories, but also like smaller histories. I think that's really significant too. Well, family stories are so important. Um, you know, I remember once I was talking to a Portuguese guy about the film and he was really excited and he told his dad, who had been a Luna in Big Island, and he told his dad, oh, there's a movie about what has Portuguese people in it. And the guy said, Hawaii, we work so hard to get out of there. Why do you want to hear about Hawaii? You know, and so a lot of the older generation might not tell those stories. Yeah. So it's kind of up to the parents, you know, to say, oh, your grandma was a picture bride. You know, this is, these are the stories that I remember. And, um, and I think also after World War II, a lot of Japanese Americans didn't want to talk about the past. They didn't want to talk about the family and it kind of got washed away. And, uh, you know, you've got to seek out those photos and ask the questions if you can. Um, in terms of where it's being preserved culturally, that's a little harder. I mean, there's some photo books. There's uh, one called A Pictorial History of the Japanese and Hawaii. That's critical. It's the, it was the basis for our costumes. It was the basis for our, you know, our props, our framing. Um, and that's just in a compilation of archival photos. The University of Hawaii has uh, archives um that you can access um, um the library of congress has archival photos and now with the internet you can probably google japanese american cane workers and get you know everything so those things are important I hope I answered the question. Yeah, and Alex also, want, I mean, I don't know if you know, if you're able to answer this, but he's, I mean, it seems like he's eager to support other productions or other efforts. Um, so I don't know if you, do you know about any ongoing projects that he can support? Really? <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you have one? <laughs> well, I've got one kid who's almost going to college and one kid who's in, almost done with college. And I always tell them, as soon as you guys leave, I'm gonna be committing some crimes. <laughs> I'm gonna be out there doing stuff again. And um, I don't have any specific projects, but I have a lot of ideas and I'm very passionate about it. And I love what you guys are doing as a film festival because it's so inspiring because, you know, you gotta keep it alive. Uh, so short answer, Alex, if you want to invest money, I don't have anything specific for you, but maybe try me in a year or so. And filmmakers, <laughs> if you have any scripts, you can send them to Brian. <laughs> uh, another question um, from Rosie is, she's asking, oh, what is, um, if you were, like, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but if, if you were to kind of remake it today, this, this story like 25 years later, um, oh, how would you, how do you think it would be like in a more kind of modern or um, in today's cinema? You mean that in the period or? Like no, um, I mean like if you were making a film about that, about that period, but um, with like today's technologies or tools, oh. or ways of getting film out. Oh my God. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, that's almost a question for Greg because Greg's a producer. He was a producer on Game of Thrones. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he does so much digital imaging and special effects and stuff like that, that yeah, I, I mean, maybe we wouldn't even needed to have gone there and, and shot, I don't know. 
Um, there's so much at the disposal of the filmmaker now. And there are also so many venues to distribute, you know. Um, there are so many formats. I mean, maybe it would be a series. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty mind-boggling question. It's exactly what it should be. Greg it says, made it exactly the right time <laughs> and exactly Craig, the right way. Craig's walking through. He says it's exactly what it should be. But, but that's not to say that if there's somebody out there that's doing a film about this period, that you shouldn't avail yourself of every technology and you shouldn't try and shoot it on your phone and you shouldn't try to, you know, do all your visual effects. You know, because you can now. We couldn't do it. We shot 35 millimeter film. It was so expensive. Processing was so expensive. Yeah, you can you shipped it to Photochem and you'd get it back yeah. four days later. Greg right? is saying that we we had to ship it, we had to we had to air freight it to Burbank where it was developed and we had no clue how because Claudio the DP was with us in Hawaii. We had no clue how it would look. We had no, we, we didn't know that some things were out of focus until we saw them five days later and we didn't have enough money to go back and shoot those shots. So those had to be trashed. Or if there was a scratch, you know, we, which back then, okay, when a film, <laughs> I have to explain that if the film gets scratched, you are totally screwed and there's nothing you can do because it's actually like gelatin on plastic and it would get scratched. So, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, and it and we lost a lot of stuff. Did that, you guys even have a video tap? I can't remember if we had a video tap. He's asking me if we had a video tap, like, and no, people, we didn't. Like actually. filmmakers today would not believe that you'd be on a feature film set and you He's couldn't talking. see and you couldn't see what you were filming. Yeah, no, we couldn't see what we were filming. Only the operator sees it. Only the operator saw it. Claudio operated a lot, but. The thing about Claudio is that Claudio is a Mexican, and Claudio went to film school at uh, Churubusco in Mexico City, where those guys made do with what they had. And I'm talking about they, they might not have had the most amazing equipment or the lights or the, the whatever tech was available even at UCLA. I mean, he came to visit UCLA and he was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, but he understood how to make something from what he had and he didn't complain and he looked at the light and in Hawaii, the light is constantly shifting because storms come in and out, there are clouds come in and out. Um, sometimes it's golden, sometimes it's gray, sometimes it's raining, sometimes there are rainbows. And, and Claudio just like found it, you know? And that's, we, we didn't have tech, but we had Claudio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean like shooting on film, every image is precious and it's the work of so much skill and luck all coming together. Yeah, um, yeah. There's one question that actually relates a little bit to this. Um, Tiffany asks, where is the site of that beautiful waterfall? <laughs> Oh, wow. She's been to Waikiki Beach and did not see a waterfall like that. Okay. This is a good story. That waterfall is on a private estate. Um, and we had looked for a waterfall. And we didn't want to get waterfall that was dirty because Yuki would have to go in it. And a lot of the waterfalls that we had access to in the state park or in the, in the Ko'olaus were polluted or dirty, uh, they didn't look good, pretty. And somebody told us about this private estate with uh, uh, three homes on it. And it's owned by one of the oldest um, um, families in Hawaii. And it's contested as a sacred site by the native Hawaiians. And it was an incredible place. It was like a paradise. They had beautiful birds on the trees and in the trees and like raspberries growing. And it, it was, uh, it was incredible. And there was this waterfall with a pool, but that waterfall isn't accessible to the public. And also they did not allow any of the native American, I mean, native Hawaiian people on our crew onto their property. 
Wow. And that day that we shot that scene, the guys, the Teamsters, who are Native, all Native American, <laughs> sorry, Native Hawaiians, they sat up in the parking lot and they sang songs all day wow. because it's their place and they weren't allowed to be there. All these behind the scenes stories sometimes are as important to tell as what's on screen too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that place is amazing. Wow. It's right outside Honolulu. Okay. Um, Rachel has a question that's kind of related, um, but also related to our previous conversation, which is about the outtakes. Like not every shot could have been, was necessarily perfect to the standards that you were hoping for, but they're still valuable. And you were there at a certain time and you got, this is, this is actually Hawaii. So she's curious, like, does this footage still exist? Oh, wow. I don't, I guess it probably did. You mean the outtakes? The outtakes, yeah. I don't know. Does it? I don't know. God, I should know that. I'm going to find out. Okay. Well, Rachel, I know, is, a, is an artist and filmmaker. So I'm pretty sure. I'm wow. Okay. Okay. I mean, we put some pieces that we couldn't help putting in. For instance, one of the wide shots, there's a white minivan driving along the ridge of a mountain in the frame. And only I ever see that white minivan. But, you know, we couldn't not have that wide shot because we had like 50 extras working in the, working in the fields. Um, but I don't know. I'll find out. Great. I don't know that. God, it was a really long time ago. Yeah. Sure. Um, Mahmoud wants to know, is the practice of, are, are these kind of arranged marriages between Hawaii and Japan, how, how, how long did that last for? I do not, I do not know. Um, my great grandma was a picture bride and she came to, she went to Texas uh, right about the turn of the century. Um, but I don't know when the practice stopped. Sorry, I don't know. Okay, but, but it's probably not happening now, right? That was part of his question. No, not that I know of. Yeah, well, now, now it's just okay, Cupid, I guess. <laughs> yeah, nobody can fake their picture. Oh, I guess they can <laughs> fake their picture. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've read a lot about how folks in Hawaii, like they, they watch this film in school. Like it's, it's part of their education now. Could you talk about like what you know about the impact of the film on kind of Hawaii's own national historical consciousness or kind of multicultural consciousness? Uh, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really the best person to answer that. I think that would be a good question for someone who continues to live, continue to live there because when we wrapped the film, I came back right away and we finished it in, in, you know, in, in uh, Los Angeles. And then we were, we were just here. Um, I mean, going back to the, to the film festivals, I saw so much pride there and where maybe somebody would have felt like their grandma or great grandma was a picture bride and that was kind of weird and kind of embarrassing and maybe it had like sort of, you know, overtones of like prostitution or something that seemed not so savory or honorable. People accept that as you know, uh, an important part of history, important part of our families. Um, also the Okinawan, you know, population that, that they were represented. And um, I think there's a little more pride there, you know? So that's the reason to make these movies, guys, because you might not, <laughs> you're giving back really something very important to people. So very important. <laughs> need to make these movies we have to find our place in history and bring it out and tell it to everybody even if there's no precedent for it like you know, <laughs> and, yeah it's, that's especially the reason to do it <laughs> that is, that's the reason and honestly you know there are so many stories to tell that they're they're extremely compelling because when you look at say a western you know like justin justin lynn's series right now mm -hmm. or you know that he's looking at it from a different perspective. He's looking at it from over here. And that's so critical because, you know, that's really what our history is. You can't let somebody else tell your history. You have to tell it. Yeah. 
Um, and it was especially exciting to know that you were all women who were telling the story. I'm looking at these photos from Sundance and it was just like five Asian women on stage, like <laughs> getting an audience award. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, so just like, so everyone knows, like the director, three credited writers, US producer, two editors, like all, all women who made this yeah. film. How conscious yeah. were you when you were making it that, you know, this is a different perspective that you were bringing? Yeah, I mean, once again, we didn't really think about, <laughs> we didn't think about that much that, I mean, you know, Kaya was, she's really a force. She was really a force in that way. Like, you know, she just didn't think no. She, you know, she really strode forward and she knew what she wanted. I mean, that was the main thing. You know, that's what I saw when she did her student film, Otemba. She knew how the Christmas tree should look. She knew how the bar scene should look. She already had, you know, this world. And so same with the, the production of the movie, you know, I don't think she ever thought, well, I don't know if we can do this because we're women or maybe they won't like us because we're women or, you know, other oh, such, you know, well, maybe they were at the beginning, but we just, I don't know, we just kept going. Yeah. And for, for those people who don't know, Kayo passed away like 15 years ago or so. She, she never really got to make a second, second feature. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you say a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've been talking about what made Kayo so special as a filmmaker, but what in your mind was her legacy that she gave to other filmmakers, Asian American filmmakers, Hawaiian filmmakers? Well, that's, you know, um, Kayo had her own um, vision. And it was kind of body and it was soulful and affectionate and fierce and sometimes condemning. Um, and so I don't know in terms of, you know, film, I mean, obviously Picture Bride, but um, she was she was just one of a kind, I mean, you know, pure. Uh, the scene of Matsuji and Kanzaki being drunk in the cane fields and like singing and stuff. And Kayo embodied that and, you know, her, she brought her own past. Her dad was, uh, he had a, the first sushi restaurant in Man Manhattan and he was a kind of a bar denizen. And, and she saw it was so much, with such a critical eye, but also love. So I don't really, I mean, in terms of her legacy, she did this beautiful movie. Right. Yeah. And she, she, she kept trying to do movies that spoke to her and that, that reflected those aspects, you know? So, um, yeah, I really am sad that she's not here telling more stories. Well, you continue to tell your stories and to be part <laughs> of some of the other people's stories. Um, and, and it's so exciting to watch this film now and think about, I mean, what about it is unique to the 90s, but also how much of it is still so resonant. So uh, Kathleen asks, like, are there any messages or lessons from the film that you think is particularly relevant for us today? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think the core, uh, the core arc of Vio is that she begins her journey thinking one thing and she has to come to grips with her shame because in the old world her parents had tb and it defined her life uh and she surmounts that and she you know she finds herself and she eventually says goodbye to her parents in a you know in a really honorable and loving way um and i think that's universal I can happen today, mm -hmm. you know, um, anybody coming to a new country or even going into a new situation, a new, you know, relationship, you have to deal with your past and your self image and you kind of have to prove yourself. So she proves herself physically and she proves her, her metal, you know, her emotional metal. So, yeah. Um, and then let's see. And another question was from, from Peter. Do you have any sort of dream collaborations that you still haven't um, tried out yet or that you're still hoping for? Yeah, I do. 
<laughs> You're going to keep it to yourself. No, no, no. I can definitely talk about him. Okay. But I don't know if that's, this is the place to talk about him, but <laughs> should I? Uh, that's, that's completely up to you. We, we want to know everything. But <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So I spent a long time interviewing a woman named Iva Toguri, who was uh, known as Tokyo Rose during World War II. She was trapped in Japan and she made radio broadcasts uh, over the Pacific. Um, and she came back and she was uh, convicted of treason and sent to jail. Um, and I spent a lot of time with her and interviewed her and wanted to tell her story. Um, and uh, also, I really like um, the idea of a 70s movie about growing up Asian American in the Bay Area in multi culti Oakland, Berkeley, and how that was. Um, because we didn't think of ourselves as minorities until we start, until sort of the culture started saying, oh, you can get money if you like are an Asian, you're going to tell, you know, there's sort of like this grant writing culture where you sort of tried to be super Asian or super Latino or, you know, um, I think that's a really interesting part of our cultural history where we were starting to define ourselves culturally good coming of age story um, and the making of an independent Asian American film and how funny that was. So those are sort of three ideas. And then there's Carlos Bulasan's book, America is in the Heart. That's a dream project. I tried to do that with Jean Kahayan, but uh, we just we just didn't we were too tired after the debut. <laughs> and we we had kids after the debut. <laughs> So yeah, a ton, lots of projects. So yeah. I mean, this is looking forward a few weeks from now because we will be kind of encouraging our people, our audiences to watch the debut. Um, oh, cool. It's 20 years, this year is the 20th anniversary. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what, are, what are your sort of memories? I'm not memories, I, I'm sure you can do a whole hour on the debut too, but. Oh yeah, oh my God, um, and you gotta get Jean. I hope you're getting Jean and John. Oh, we, we, we have to we have to do something for the 20th. Because <laughs> well, I don't um, know if you were, were you there for our, for the San Diego Asian Film Festival? Yeah. First ever? Yes, you know. I was there. I had like baby barf on my shoulder because I had I my baby orphan. Yeah, I felt yeah. like, yeah, no, I drove down and it was amazing. It was yeah, so that cool. was the first, that was our opening night of our first film festival. Really? Our history as well, yeah. The debut is great. Yeah, it was our debut as well. That um, wow! What, so you have to get Jean and John. You have to get Jean. We're still working together. Great, great. So let me know if you need help. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. Um, okay, I think we're about at an hour. I can't believe this one by so fast. I'm in fact dark in my room now. I know. Uh, but Lisa, thank you so much for oh. all of your work. Just like bringing Asian America of the past, bring Hawaii of the past and kind of bringing it to life here tonight and taking your time to chat with us. Um, thank you to the audience for sure. all of your great questions. Um, and of course, if you haven't seen Lisa's other films, Forbidden City USA, the debut, we have instructions on how to find them, um, stream them online on our website right now. Um, they're all both part That's of our awesome. May Madness series. That's so cool. And then, um, and is American Knees, is that pretty, is that still accessible? I don't know if that's distributed. You know, American Knees is, um, it has not been distributed and I'm working on getting it distributed because it's a, an amazing movie um, based on Sean Wong's novel. Uh, Michael Paul Chan is in it. Uh, Chris Tashima, Joan Chan, yep. um, Allison C. It's an amazing, very, uh, Moody, beautiful love story. It's directed by Eric Byler. I don't know if you guys know him. Of course, he's a well, director. Yeah, he did Charlotte sometimes. So we're working on it. 